Church live streaming this Sunday evening. Please take your hymn books and turn to 131. Christ is all I need. circumstances come in their lives and that circumstance caused them to hang their harps of worship up. May you never hang your harp of worship up. If life takes its greatest turn toward the worst, may you still praise your Lord and Savior. I hope that will be the case for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Father, we come before you, you the God of worthiness. The God that is worthy of all praise. The God is worthy of all worship. The God that is worthy of our continuous praise and worship. And so, Lord, we come to you today. We don't understand the whys to everything, but we know this much, that you're doing what's right. And that, Father, whatever you see fit to do, you're doing it, and we thank you for that. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for being a God that, for whatever your reason. For whatever your reason, you've allowed us to go into this stay-at-home type of a situation. So, Father, we ask that we would learn in solitude to praise and worship you. And, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that the presence of you would be felt in every house, 
The presence of you would be felt in every, every place that technology is allowing this to be heard. Father, may our hearts go out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I'll tell you one story, and then we'll sing another hymn. We, uh, this morning, of course, had the privilege of being at North Highlands Baptist, uh, actually Faith Baptist Tabernacle in North Highlands, California, Brother Mike Rogers, and that was a pleasure this morning. And uh, earlier this week, though, we as a church sent some money to the, uh, the Schmitz because we just became concerned throughout this week about their financial status, being an evangelist, not being on the on the uh, road, and so what was their financial status and how it was doing, and so we sent some money as a church, and I just want you to know that, and we did the same with the Shocks, and we did the same with the church planter, James Cook, over in Concord, and so, but this morning we went to uh, there, and the Schmitz were there, it was a joy, and Brother Schmidt told me the story, he said that this week they had a, a financial need that was coming upon them, and he said that when he came into the house, he said Miss Megan came to him and had the check from our church and was praising the Lord that this is the answer to their prayers. And so church, in the midst of this trying time, God is still on the throne doing a job and getting praise. And so I want to thank you. Thank you for how you give so that we can give and uh, be used of God in that mighty fashion. All right, James, do you have another hymn? Amen. Let's sing, church. 145. It is well with my soul. Can you say it with me? Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So the songwriter, H.G. Spafford, said, when things are going peaceful, he said, God's taught me to say it is well. He said, when the bottom falls out from under me, God has taught me to say, 
it is well with my soul. See, what Spafford learned was circumstances are not what makes things right with your soul between you and God. Not circumstances. Circumstances is what Satan would love to steal your wellness from you. But circumstances alone can't do it. You have to make that willful decision. So I hope that tonight, as H.G. Spafford said it, and keep in mind, he was speaking that as the ship he was traveling on was sailing in a given location that the captain of the ship came to him and said, it's roughly right here that the ship that had your wife and your daughters and some of your loved ones drowned right here at this location and that's when Spafford went in and wrote the song it is well with my soul he learned the lesson didn't he circumstances did not steal his wellness from his well, between he and his God and so please I, I hope such is the case with you that you have learned as H.G. Spafford did to be able to say it is well with my soul all right, let's take our Bibles and stand together, please. We're in the book of Numbers, chapter 18. Numbers, chapter 18. We want to begin reading in verse 1. We will read the first seven verses of this new chapter in the book of Numbers. Numbers, chapter 18. We will begin reading out loud together in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood, and thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee, that they may be joined unto thee, and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness, and they shall keep thy charge and the charge of all thy tabernacle. Only they shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar that neither they nor ye also die. And they shall be joined unto thee, and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation, for all the service of the tabernacle, and a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. And ye shall keep the charge of the sanctuary, and the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. And I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord, to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Let's pause there. Let me point out two things. No less than three times did the scripture say, Thou and thy sons. I'm looking at it right there. It says it clearly. Thou and thy sons. And the point I'm after here is, is what a privilege it must have been to serve God with his family, whoever that was. Serving God with your family, what a joy that is. I want to encourage everyone. Live your life in such a capacity. Raise your children in such a capacity. Pray for your family in such a capacity that you can serve God with your children. What a pleasure that will be down through life to you. And then in verse 7, this is the priesthood. This was the job, the service that they were to do. And it says this, in verse 7 it said, 
I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of gift. In other words, it's a twofold statement here. First off, God's given them the opportunity to serve, and God's, it's a gift God's given to them. Isn't that wonderful? But as the second thing is that God's given them the opportunity to serve so as giving them something that they can give as a gift back to God, I will serve. If you have good health, use that good health as a gift to God and serve him with it. If you say my health's not as good, do what you can do. Serve God as your gift to God. James, would you come and pray for us, please, and lead us in one more song, please, sir. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've blessed us with. Thank you for the good service you gave us this morning. Please bless this evening, but glorify and honor you. Please touch each and every heart that is watching or will be watching in the future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey. Let's go ahead and take our hymn books, please, and turn to 146. 146, a shelter in the time of storms. <laughs> Then a voice so kind and gentle 
somewhere nobody's around, and all of a sudden God stepped into your living room with you. And as a child of the living God, He's showing you there used to be a joy in your heart that's missing tonight. Oh, friend, stop at nothing to let God replace that joy. where we're headed, chapter 1. And as you find your place, would you stand with me, please? James chapter 1 is where we will begin reading in verse 1, and I'm going to read only the first four verses this evening of James chapter 1. Scripture says in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it, not, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And we'll pause there and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. It's been a wonderful service already to me. You gave James some beautiful and some wonderful, not just poetic, not just beautiful music, Lord. That's not what I'm talking about, although that's the case. But, Lord, some marvelous truths. It is well with my soul, no matter what. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. It baffles my mind, God. To think of a holy you and a sinful us and to think that you would privilege us by allowing us to call you our God. Glory. God, your Bible's open. The word that can change a life. The word that can Shine and chase away all darkness of sin. The word that can give answers to which way to go in life. The word of you, God, that can, can scare away depression and instill hope. And Father, we ask that you do all of that and so much more. Whatever's needful tonight through your word, God, would you do it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We've got the book of James this evening, and we're in chapter 1 tonight. And in chapter 1, this book of James, this chapter is has a theme of patience. Patience in trouble. 
or patience in the midst of turmoil, patience in trouble. Well, in this, we find first off, and we're going to deal with four different yet vital and vitally important questions about this and this book of James. First off, who is this book? Who is this man named James? Well, his description doesn't give us a clue as far as to who he physically was, but we see who he is spiritually speaking. He says in James chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he left no stone unturned. He's a servant of the living God. He doesn't appear to be ashamed of it. Just boldly is telling us. In a letter to whoever will read it, I am a servant of the living God. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And for him, maybe even within his lifetime, the one that I remember who died for my sins, the one that I remember the sadness of seeing him buried, and the one that I remember the overwhelming joy upon the news Yet a question mark, is it real that he is resurrected from the grave? And then to find out, yes, he is resurrected, that joy was just unbridled and turned loose within his soul. This is that James. This is that James. If we try to talk about this James, physically speaking, well, there are many Jameses that the Bible references. There is a man named James, and you know of him as well, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, John, one of the disciples. And so there's that brother, that man named James. Then there's the man named James, the son of Alphaeus. Then there's the man named James, the father of Judas, the disciple. And look with me in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, and go with me to verse 55, we'll look at two verses there. Matthew chapter 13, and I'll look at verse 55, and the scripture said, Is not this, making reference to Jesus, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James, and there's that name. And Joseph, and Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all of us, all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And so we see that, first off, I'll point out that this is Jesus, and Jesus had physical brothers and sisters. There are some that like to say Jesus was the only one and that there is no, none other that is a physical brother to Christ. That's not so. Scripture says that he had brothers and sisters. You see them. Count them with me. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. He has four brothers. And then it says, and his sisters. It did not say sisters singular. It said sisters plural. So he had at least two or more sisters that he had. And so we find that would mean that Jesus had at least six or more siblings. That means there was at least seven in his family. Children. At least seven. Depends on how many sisters when it says that plural that it would make reference to. Many believe that the author of the book of James was this James... That's literally and physically the brother of Jesus Christ. And many believe that it's that brother James. And so if such is the case, and I tend to lean to that very thought that it was this James that was the writer that God used to write the book of James, it's noteworthy that he keeps entirely out of sight. It doesn't go around Christ. Had popularity. You don't see this James riding this coattail as if I'm somebody, I'm the brother of the big one. You don't see that mindset. You don't see that happening. James was, if such is the case, if such is the case, we know that this James was not always a follower of Jesus Christ. He at some point became a follower, and this James was apparently. A very spiritual man. He didn't need the limelight. 
He could have had it very easily. That's my brother. He didn't do that. He just somehow was behind the scenes, but when God called on him, said, I want you to write this, he was ready to write. He was in a right status with his God. And so we find that you see these many references, and there are uh, to this man, James. I'll say it as well that you'll find many references to Jesus' sayings throughout the writings of James. And so you'll find Jesus with many references that are spoken of by him. One of the, re one of the most common references that people quote Jesus is out of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7, Three, you've heard me say it. I, I, I assume you've heard me say it. I have said it. I'll say it that way. The greatest preacher, Jesus Christ. The greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And so what a preacher and what a, what a sermon. And it was quoted maybe more than any other one thing Jesus said from one given place. Sermon on the Mount may have had the most quotes. Well, back in James chapter 1, in verse 1 it said, James, a servant of God and the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. And there's that statement, greeting. He's opening it up. James wrote to Christian Jews. Christian Jews that were living outside of Palestine is who he was writing to. You see the word scattered in verse 1, that he wrote to the twelve tribes. Tribes that, that would be the, the tip off on its Jews, Christian Jews, 12 tribes, and notice how it says it, scattered abroad, so they're not in Palestine, and so we find that these have been dispersed and scattered abroad, and so we find that these are the ones this letter is to. The definition carries for the word scattered, carries with it a thought of as scattering seed. And so a, a dipping into the, the satchel or a dipping into the hands into a bag and scattering the seed. And so it's as if James, with the seed of the Word of God, and he's already got some fertile ground that's beginning to grow, and he's adding seed, and he's, he's fertilizing seed, and he's watering this seed and hoping that it'll grow. When the Jewish believers were scattered in that first wave of persecution. If you were in your minds back in Acts chapter 8, remember how Saul had gone in and he would be responsible for hauling people out and, and killing people. Many began to scatter. You'll let me pause and say that it took persecution. God wanted to send the first missionaries out of the church of, of Jerusalem, but they got stale. They got stagnant. You'll, uh, you'll remember that they got enamored with three things that we've seen before in the book of Acts. They got enamored with money. They got enamored with miracles. They got enamored with the multitudes. They wanted numbers, numbers, numbers. And it almost turned a reverse on them to where they did not want people to leave and go tell abroad the gospel because they wanted their numbers to grow. But nonetheless, God came in with persecution and scattered those people out of the of the uh, the church at Jerusalem. In other words, you can go willfully or you can go by force, but you're going to go. I can almost hear God saying it just like that. I am sending you. I'm not asking. I'm commanding. And so they went. They were scattered. Now I've said it again as before. I'd rather be obedient willfully than by force any day of the week. First off, it doesn't feel real good when your arm's behind you and being twisted and cranked on. That's not a good feel. And so nonetheless, here we've got in Acts chapter 8 that they were scattered abroad, Christian Jews throughout the Roman Empire. And they would have needs. They would have problems as they went. And these Christian Jews, as they were going and being a Jew, first off, in a Gentile world, just like the Gentiles were viewed as dogs to the Jews, the Jews were viewed as dogs to the Gentiles. And here they go, trying to tell the world, trying to tell the Gentiles that there is a salvation 
through a Jewish Messiah. And so there was going to be some problems involved with that. Being a Christian Jew, they'd be rejected by their own countrymen because as a whole, the Jews, Israel, rejected Christ. And so now here they are, Christian Jews, and so there would be almost a natural rejection of these Jews that had gotten saved. But now for them to be Jews and out in the Gentile world, there was a rejection by the Gentiles because, man, you're a Jew. And so they were being rejected on both sides. I'm reminded of the story of a young man we used to preach in a church in Southern California. And this young man was there, probably preached in this church for 15 years. And this young man grew up in that Christian school. And finally he reached the age of 18 and he was excited. He's now going to join the Marines. I don't know why in the world anybody would want to be a jarhead, but nonetheless, that's what he thought he'd do. He's going to join the Marines. And as he tried to do it, he found out that he was not a citizen of the United States, and he didn't know it. And this young man, who I can state personally, I have a love for that young man. I have been praying for that young man. And that young man found out that they were illegal immigrants. They were not citizens of the United States. So he goes home, turmoil within, asks his parents where was he born because he wants to get his birth certificate. He goes to Mexico to the very hospital that they said he was born in. And the hospital had no record of his birth. All of a sudden, we've got a young man at the age of 18, ready to step out of the, into the world, ready to become and begin to seize the, the, the opportunities of adulthood, only to find out he is a man without a country, literally. He had no citizenship. He became bothered. He became bitter. And all of a sudden, he turned on God. And if he's listening to me tonight, I want that young man to know there's a preacher that loves him. There's a preacher that prays for him. There's a preacher that thinks of him frequently. And if you're listening to me, friend, I hope that you will not take out on God what man has done. Run to Christ. Live for Christ. Nonetheless, we find these Jews very similar. Their own country didn't want them. The people they were going to doesn't want them. And so this is the kind of crowd James is writing this letter to. Talk about trouble. They had trouble. So in the presence of that trouble, James writes this letter. And James begins to... Tell them, I want you to have, remember the theme of the chapter? Patience in your trouble. If we could think about it in the United States of America today, and I feel fairly confident with this statement that we don't have any trouble compared to the trouble they were experiencing. And if the trouble they were experiencing far exceeds the trouble we're experiencing, then we can hear God say, if I told them to have patience in their trouble, how much the more will I say to you, have patience in your trouble. Thirdly, dealing with this man, James, question, question number one that I dealt with, that who is he? And I'm giving you my supposition, I believe him to be the physical brother of Jesus Christ out of Matthew 13, verse 55 and 56. Secondly, we dealt with who was he writing to? He was writing to Jews that were scattered because of persecution and being scattered because of persecution, they probably just went from trouble to trouble because all of a sudden their countrymen don't want them and all of a sudden the Gentile people they went to doesn't want them. Thirdly, why did James write this letter? The Christian Jews were going through difficult tests. They were facing temptations to sin. 
How much easier would it be to just denounce this God and at least somebody would receive me? Would you let me pause right there and just drive a nail down? My prayer for every member of my family and my church is that you never turn your back on God. I have posed this to my family and I will pose it to the church as well. If they ever take this preacher or if they ever take your dad and they start persecuting me and they start putting all kinds of hardships on me, if any authority ever comes to you and says, turn your back on, on your God and will lighten the tortures on your dad, now all of a sudden you've got a dilemma on you. I've said this to my family. Church, listen, now all of a sudden you've got a dilemma. What do you do? I want you in your imagination to come to my prison window and holler into my prison window. Preacher, they said they would stop torturing you if I will just denounce Christ. What do you want me to do? If I'll be in my right mind, I'll say this. I want you to keep on living for God, and I want you to pray for your pastor. Friends, don't turn your back on God. There is not one reason to turn your back on God. There is not one reason to turn your back on God. We've got some people that I'm concerned about that you're putting your family over God, and if persecution came upon your family and they said it to you, you would run away from God to spare your family, and I'm telling you, friend, you'll regret that. Trust your family to God and let Him care for them and ask Him to get them through. Do anything you can, but don't turn your back on God. Do anything you can. And so facing temptations of sin, these Jews with troubles on either side had temptation. Some believers were catering to the rich. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Give me enough money and I'll say anything you want. You can almost hear that mindset because it's not far removed from pulpits around the world today. Matter of fact, some folks are surprised anymore. That money does not buy what they're after with a preacher. I saw one preacher. I saw him as he was preaching, and he had several signs that said, not for sale. And as he would preach, he would hang a sign on the pulpit, not for sale, not for sale, not for sale. Maybe some preachers are selling themselves out. I don't know. That's not what I'm after. But I'm here to tell you today, if God will be my helper, I want to be true to him. I don't want to sell out. And as I stand right now, you're hearing a preacher that's not for sale. You're hearing a preacher that's in the fight for the cause of right. You're hearing a preacher that's in the fight for the cause of righteousness. It's in the fight for the truth of this Bible. Oh, church, may you follow the lead that God, that thought that God has put in me, and may you not sell out. May you not sell out. And so these had a fight, and some were catering to the rich, and others were being robbed by the rich. Church members were competing for offices in the church, particularly the teaching offices. It seemed to be a prize to be had. I, I can have a teaching position. People look at me. People respect me. People somehow have a certain certain thought of me. And so there was a pride issue going on. One of the major problems in the church was a failure on the part of many to live what they professed they believed. And if there's a problem in the church around the world today, and I don't know everywhere around the world, but I can put my finger on America. And I've got a good thought on the heartbeat of American churches. I've got a good thought on that. It's one thing to say I go to a church that believes this. It's a whole different thing to live what you believe. It's one thing to say as a preacher, and I've seen too many of them, and you have too. 
Too many preachers that will stand up and preach it right and live it wrong. And our nation is in a struggle sometime. And our nation is having problems because of this. And so was this, these believers. So James was writing a letter to these. There's more of a problem going on with these that had gotten out. Scattered abroad, as verse 1 said. And the next problem they had was they had some serious issues with their tongues. They were creating wars. They were creating divisions amongst believers, all because there was no control over their mouth. They may come to the assembly and then the whatever, the bickering, the gossiping, the whatevers. You ever see them, don't you? Do they stand there and whisper to each other? Get like those school children, get back off to the side, and look around, see if anybody's looking. If nobody's looking, they'll whisper. They'll go outside where nobody is and stand out there in the darkness all by themselves and whisper. Come on! It's time for Christianity to grow up and start living what we believe instead of following the wrong crowds. Worldliness. The mouth had gotten out of control. Worldliness was seeping into this body. This is the crowd that, J that James is writing to. Some members disobeyed God and were sick because of it. Their disobedience... God had taken, you said, does God send sickness? He does. But let me tell you as well, God may not send sickness. He may just take his hand of protection away because we're not right with him. And when his hand of protection comes away, all of a sudden everything that he had been holding back now falls on us. And we think it's God's fault. When in all reality, it's not God's fault. Just the obedience that it was taking to be able to live for God and for him to, to say, I'll put my hand of protection. The promises of where he says, I'll put a protection about them if they'll do this. And when they stop doing this, I'll take my hand off. And all of a sudden, the problems come and people shake their fist at God and say, it's his fault. But in all reality, it's your fault, friend. For not obeying the God of glory who told you exactly what to do to get his protection and you didn't do it and his protection's gone, don't blame God. Seems that James is dealing with some pretty up-to-date matters, doesn't it? 2,000 years ago, and yet still today, this book, that's what one Chinese uh, native said to the missionary. He said, you tell me that this Bible is thousands of years old, portions of it. He said, I know that is not the truth. Because he said, as I read the Bible you've given me, it reads like it's modern day society. Such is the case. Why would that be? Satan is no fool. If the temptation that he could get people to fall and turn away from God back 2,000 years ago worked, why change when it's working? And he just keeps issuing the same false doctrine. He just keeps issuing the same temptations. And so, therefore, it reads like a modern book. All of these problems have the same root problem. What is it? A heart problem. Their relationship with God, poor. Are they saved? I believe they're saved. But they're poor. Notice in verse 2, he said, my brethren. So I believe they're saved. But spiritually speaking, they're immature. These Christians simply were not growing up. You say, preacher, you've bumped on that a little bit here recently. Why are you bumping on it so much? Because I believe that's one of the problems with the United States of America today is immaturity in the pews of our churches amongst believers. It's time for us to grow up. Quit riding the... the the so-called free ticket to heaven and live like I'm on my way to hell ticket. It's time to live what we say we have. It's time to do it. It always has been time. It always has been. So these, these Christians simply were not grown up. James used the word perfect several times throughout this 
this. You see it in verse 4. But let patience have her perfect, there it is, work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And that's not meaning we're sinless. I know God wants us to be sinless, but we're still in this flesh. And that doesn't mean go do what you want to do. <clears throat> I mean, we need to be in the fight against this flesh, not just letting it have its head and do what it wants. This word perfect means complete. Complete in Christ. And so we see that James is speaking to them, and he's trying to teach them, and he's trying to show them how to grow up as Christians. The members of this church were not mature enough to eat solid food like the church at Corinth. We begin to look at some of the problems that were existing. James dealt with them in this book. Notice in chapter 1, in verses 1 through 4, notice how he says the word in verse 3, patience. And then you come into verse 4, there it is again, patience. And remember I said that the theme of this chapter is patience in trouble. So what does that tell us about part of the problem with these Christians? They were impatient. I want what I want, and I want it right now. You can hear this mindset. You can hear some spoiled brat somewhere crying, I want this, I want this. You've seen them. It makes my blood boil in a grocery store when some child sitting in a in a, 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 a the cart, and they go, Arr! They want something. And the mom or dad or whoever it is, no, you can't have that. Ah. And finally, the child gets its way. I feel like saying, listen, child, would you get out of the cart? Mom, Dad, would you get in the cart where the child was and let the child push the cart? <laughs> it's ridiculous to me. Well, anyway, difficulties came upon these scattered brethren, and they became impatient. Notice another problem in chapter 2 and verse 14. In chapter 2 and verse 14, the scripture says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, what's the problem that's being referenced here? The problem is they're talking, but they're not living truth. They're talking, but they're not living proof truth. So all of a sudden, it's like somebody says, I believe the Bible says, thou shalt not lie, and then turn around and tell a lie. You've heard the statement, the only time her, her, the only time she lies is when her lips are moving. I mean, that's, that's this kind of Christian that's talking about. Talking, but not living truth. Look in chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, and you'll find another one where he talks about not only talking but not living it. There's absolutely no control over that mouth. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we, in chapter 3, verse 1, shall receive the greater condemnation. Verse 2, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, meaning complete. And able also to bridle the whole body. In other words, if you can't bridle your mouth, you can't bridle your rest of your body. Behold, verse 3, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. If you don't put the, 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 the holy, the divine bit of the Word of God in the mouth of a Christian so that they can now be guided by God to go where they want, to say what he wants, to do what he wants, then there's going to be a problem. So they had a problem with the control of their mouth. Look in chapter 4. In verse 1, the scripture says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? And so these Christians were fighting. Why were they fighting? Because there was no control over their mouth is one. One person says something, and the other person says, you shouldn't have said that. And this person over here says, well, I just believe a person ought to say what they mean and mean what they say, and so I just call it as I see it, and 
You're a big, fat, ugly slob. What? You don't have any business saying that. You need to control how you eat. Can you see a mouth problem? Can you see wars coming on because of, because of a mouth problem that was going on here? Look in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that ye that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. What's the problem in verses 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 5? Materialism. They've got something heaped up. They got the wrong things heaped up. What they've got heaped up, the scripture says in verse 2, has corrupted. Would you let me say it's not only corrupted, such as deteriorated within itself, it's corrupted them themselves. It's one thing to God to say, I'll supply your every need. It's another thing for us to fall in love with what he supplies with and try to mount up an enormous amount of what God supplies. So the church has, or these believers have problems. I'm convinced that the spiritual immaturity is a major problem, not the number one problem maybe, but it is playing a part in almost all of these problems that's going on. The heart of the church today is not where God wants it to be. Would you let me not take it take it off of such a broad statement? Would you let me say it, bring it right down to Lighthouse Baptist Church? The heart of Lighthouse Baptist Church is not where God wants it to be. I thank God for where we aren't. But may we not be content where we are. May we be striving to get ever closer to God. If James had outlined his letter based on the theme of maturity, if he would have done that, it most likely would have looked, you know, in some fashion similar to showing the problems like we've showed them today. The epistle of James logically follows the epistle to the Hebrews, and it's in a good position coming right after Hebrews does. For one of the major things of Hebrews is spiritual perfection. Remember what the word perfection means? Completion. And he brings up completion, and they need to be complete. Praise God, they're saved, but they aren't complete. They need to get that building on the foundation of Jesus Christ going. Let me deal with the fourth thing. How can we get the most out of this book of James? As we begin to look at it and peruse over it and through it, James chapter 1 and verse 18 says this. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits, he says, of his creatures. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, and I go to verse 23. Scripture says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. A person who is born again when the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and uses it to bring a sinner under conviction and then to reveal the Savior to him. See, that's the move of God in the saving of a soul. He begins to talk to that person. That person begins to realize, I'm not right with God. Sure, we're saved by faith, and I'm not challenging that. But we have to have an honest examination of our lives and let God have a watch over our lives. Look to chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word. Now, a person that's lost, just now becoming saved, has no clue what everything in this word, but I've been saved since I was 14 years old. I don't know everything in this Bible. But when a person gets saved, they're giving their heart 
to do what they find. And when the Holy Spirit enlightens their heart, it's not, oh, I don't want to do that. It's not, oh, I'm going to go do this instead of go to church. It's not that. When a person is encountered, a child of God that's right with God, when they are encountered with the Word of God showing something to them of what they should be doing or not doing, they strive to do it or don't do it. Their goal is to be obedient to this God. That's, that's the game plan. Maybe you've heard about the primitive savage who looked into a mirror for the first time. He was so shocked at what he saw, he broke the mirror Scared himself. Many Christians make the same mistake with the Word of God. They begin to look into this book that God calls a glass or a mirror. And they look into it and they, ah, they don't like what they see. And so therefore they take the Bible and put it on a shelf and rarely read it because it shows them themselves and they aren't happy with it. It's easy to hear something. It's harder to practice it. Look with me over to the book of John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. Look at verse 17. If any man will do his will, I have those four words underlined in my Bible, will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. I read of a man who was burdened, and this man was burdened to grow more patient. And he prayed and asked God to help him. Well, that morning he missed the train on his way to work. And for the next 50 minutes, while waiting on the next train, he complained the whole time about missing the train. As the next train arrived, he arrived, he realized, I prayed for patience. God gave me an opportunity, and I missed and did not learn patience. The Lord's given all of us an opportunity to learn patience right now. How many say with me right now, I'm tired of this staying in home business? Anybody can moan and groan over that a little bit? Let God teach you patience in the middle of it. Anybody that can hear under the sound of my voice say, I'm just ready for the, 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 the restraints to be lifted and we can go back to where we used to be. Anybody there? Just ask God to teach you patience in the middle of it. Let's learn, let's, let's learn something while we're here. Don't give up. Use this time as an opportunity to grow spiritually. I don't like this. What part of that do you not like? Ask God to teach you patience. Ask God to give you understanding. Spiritual maturity isn't easy, but it's best. Go for it. We must allow God to measure our spiritual condition and let him tell it to us. I know somebody that if they want something, they can ask, can I have this? Can I do this? If we say no to them, they turn it around and ask again. Well, why not? La, 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 la. But, la, 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 la. And it ends up in a debate. Am I not right? And they It's going back and forth, back and forth. Now, that's how we handle adults. That is nowhere under the sun the way I would handle it if it were my child. If I, if I my child asked, Dad, can I do this? And I said, no. If my child says, but my child would get that look that tells them, I just stepped on thin ice. Just take the answer the first time and live with it. Well, preacher, why 
are you saying that? It's because it's time to grow up and quit acting like a child. I'm a Christian. I understand. It's time to grow up. Don't act like a child. God wants us to be mature. Mature Christians. Maturity breeds happiness. And as Christians grow more mature, they'll find that there's more happiness. Well, well preacher, that, that maturity doesn't change the circumstances. No, I understand that. It helps you to learn how to deal with them with a happy spirit. So let's be mature. Let's bow our heads this evening. With our heads bowed tonight, every one of us, nobody under the sound of this preacher's voice is spiritually arrived. Every one of us needs to have some more maturity, another block laid in the foundation. So this evening, with our heads bowed and Miss Nadine's at the piano already about to play, I'm going to ask you this evening, as a child of the living God, would you submit yourself right now to God? Would you mind just saying to God, God, help me to grow up. Help me to be more spiritually mature. Would you say that to God tonight? Would you allow him to do that work in your life? God, teach me patience. Teach me to take the answer the first time and not ask four more times or to try and change the mind of the one that gave you the answer. And may we, Father, I, I'm firmly persuaded that probably every person here tonight, you've got a goal that will demand a certain level of spiritual maturity. Father, here we are. Father, please, may you grow us into usability for the position that you fully desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and good night. Thank you.